President-elect Donald Trump announcing Scott Besson has, is his pick for Treasury Secretary, ending a contentious race for the cabinet role. Now, the hedge fund manager who indicated or has indicated his support for the former president's proposed policies, including tariffs and also extending tax cuts. We want to bring in Jason Furman. He's a current professor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and also previously served as chairman for the Council of Economic Advisors under the Obama administration. Jason, it's great to have you back here on Yahoo Finance. It's just take a look at the market's reaction to the news that developed over the weekend. It looks to be a calming, calming signal here for investors. I'm curious what you make of the pick and what you think the implications of Besson there as Treasury Secretary are going to be for the economy. Um, look, I think that Besson was a good pick. Um, he's mainstream. He knows a lot about the world of finance. I hope he had learns a lot about the world of public policy, which is one he hasn't been um, steeped in, but I'm sure he can do that. Um, the bigger issue, though, is that the main calls on the economy are going to be President Trump's. President Trump sent us a bit of signal about how he'd make those calls with this pick, but he hasn't sent us any signals that he's given up on, you know, large across the board tariffs. And until I hear that, I'm going to be nervous. Well, talk to me about what would give you clarity then, Jason, because it, it seems like there's this question mark right now about kind of the rivals that Trump has put in his personnel surrounding him, that they don't all necessarily agree about one central economic thesis. So when will you and the broader market have that clarity and what might that look like? You know, I think we'll get it over the next six months. And, and what it depends on is, are tariffs a good thing in and of themselves? a way to raise money from other countries, which is, by the way, false? Or do they think tariffs are a negotiating tactic and they're willing to get something in exchange for not doing them? If it's that second path, the negotiating tactic, and that's what Scott Besant has emphasized in some of his public comments, then hopefully they're willing to take a pretty small win, declare victory, and keep the focus on China, which they should. But we don't need tariffs on Australia, New Zealand, and Germany. Um, in fact, I don't even know what wins that we want from, from those countries. So, Jason, it sounds like you're viewing him as almost as a safe pick here for not only the markets, but also for the economy under Trump. Yeah, he's the safest pick uh, that was on that list. Well, uh, there are other safe picks on the list. Anyway, he was, he's a safe pick. Um, he knows what he's doing. If we hit financial problems, I think he would be able to figure out um, how to work together with the Fed and handle them. He's a responsible adult. But again, the Treasury Secretary does not make policy. The president makes policy. And this is a small hint about how the president might make policy, but only a small one. And in fact, the Senate only got this job when he said much more pro-tariff things than you know, my hope is um, that, that he actually thinks and believes. You know, I'm curious uh, on that uh, wavelength there, just the just strategy of this pick. I guess, what do you think, Jason, this tells us about some of the future picks, NEC chairs, some of the other key um, names or key uh, policymakers that have not been named just yet? Does this show maybe a drift or, or, or a break than what we've seen from some of the other nominations so far under the incoming Trump administration? Look, um, in the first Trump term, you saw a lot of um, heterogeneity on the economic team. They range from protectionists like Peter Navarro to you know free traders like Gary Cohn. And I expect you'll see something like that now. The president, in some areas, doesn't mind hearing discussion and debate, and economics is one of those areas. Um, national security, law enforcement, health, there you're seeing much more united, consistent picks to push the things in the direction that he wants to push it in. On the economy, I expect a lot of push and pull within the administration over these topics. It's, it's interesting because the markets thought four years ago, for example, that Yellen was going to moderate, moderate some of Biden's inflationary policies, and that turned out to be harder than anticipated. Do you think the market's ahead of itself in terms of how much power Besant is going to potentially have to curb any inflationary policies? Yeah, I think it, it's ahead of itself. And, and, and by the way, on inflation, I just haven't seen anything from this administration that is anything other than a large fiscal expansion. Yes, they have this Department of Government efficiency. I'm skeptical it's going to come up with a whole lot in the way of savings, but um, that'll be massively outweighed whatever they do with tax cuts. And I expect defense spending increases that, by the way, I think we need in this country as well. So, you know, Scott Besant could end up really having to grapple with the fiscal situation 
with rising interest rates over time, um, even if the bond market was momentarily happy today. Mm -hmm. Well, on the topic of those rising interest rates, we spoke with Scott Besson back in July about Fed independence. He had previously floated the idea of nominating a replacement shadow Fed chair that would potentially dilute Fed Chair Powell's power before Powell's term is up. Here's what Besson had to say about that. I think President Trump understands that you know what anchors uh, inflation expectations is the credibility of the Federal Reserve. I, I think Jerome Powell has done an extremely poor job, but I, I don't think it's to anybody's advantage to fire him. I think you know, President Trump's going to make his opinion known, but you know I, I would not advocate for replacing Jerome Powell before the end of his term. So Jason, sounds like Powell, he's not going to be out, but if there is this shadow Fed chair in the form of Kevin Warsh, for example, what would that potentially do to the Fed? And how are you thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, Besant also walked off, walked away from that shadow Fed chair idea. It's a terrible idea, and um, you know, and I don't think, I hope we don't see it again. The choices about the Fed are going to be made by the president. If he's tweeting things like Jay Powell is worse than President Xi of China, um, do I think that like hurts the economy and hurts inflation? Maybe not. Um, would I advise a president that that's a good thing to do? Absolutely not. And so I expect at a minimum we're going to hear a bunch of unnecessary noise. But, um, you know, what happens if inflation is resurgent because of the tariffs? They raise interest rates by a quarter point. You know, are we going to continue to see the restraint they're talking about now? Um, I'm not sure. Jason, what is the biggest risk or the two biggest risks of a shadow Fed chair? that the market needs I mean, to know. The biggest risk is much of how the Fed operates is by setting expectations for what it'll do in the future. And, and any uncertainty and unpredictability just um, increases volatility. It can deter investment. And ultimately, as Besant correctly said in that clip you showed, um, the Fed's credibility is the cheapest way to bring inflation down and keep inflation low. If it loses that credibility, um, inflation will start to drift up and it'll be very painful to reverse it. Jason, while we have you, I want to switch gears a bit and talk about an op-ed that you wrote in the journal about how to regulate AI without stifling innovation. And regulation is a key uh, part of the incoming administration's policy agenda here. What do you think that that regulation should and could look like? Yeah, so first of all, the goal of the regulation should be to get more AI. This is not something we should be afraid of. We should be afraid of not having enough of it to give us the innovation we need for education, for wages, for um, medical research, et cetera. Don't think we should have a single super regulator. Just let each domain, you know, for cars, is the car safe or unsafe? That's who should be regulating it, not um, some AI super regulator. And I also think, and I hope this administration does this, we need to get rid of some of the obstacles that stand in the way of AI, things that, for example, make it harder to set up nuclear power plants that they'll need to create um, you know, the type of clean energy to fuel their data centers. Jason, one of the things that you brought up in this op-ed that stuck out to me is not every problem caused by AI can be solved by regulating AI. Talk to me a little bit more about what you mean by that. Yeah, let's say AI is taking jobs. I, I don't believe that that's the central case, but it might be the case. Okay. You don't want to reprogram the AI not to take people's jobs. Taking people's jobs is the process of efficiency as the economy moves forward. But what you do want is new training programs, new education programs, maybe tax benefits for people, et cetera. So it's non-AI solutions to that challenge that's created by AI. That would be one example. I also thought it was interesting, especially given the rally that we've seen in small caps over the last week, Jason, what you mentioned about little tech needing a little bit of help in, from regulators. Talk to me more about that. Yeah, I mean, there's been ideas floating around, and Sam Altman has floated this idea that the AI super regulator should certify you as to whether you're allowed to have a large language model. And who could pass that certification? OpenAI could pass that certification, so could Anthropic, so could Alphabet. But you know, a lot of smaller companies would have a harder time with it. So we do not want to create regulations that make it harder for small businesses to compete in this space. Now, right now, this is an extremely expensive space that's dominated by data and compute, huge barrier to entry. But we may start having some innovation in the form of algorithms and smaller businesses that can grow and certainly smaller businesses that can build on top 
of um, the larger fundamental models don't want any regulation to get in the way of that. So Jason, I'm curious then, I guess, how should regulation then be approached? Because at one, at one end of the spectrum, you want, it to be, you want it to be, I guess, addressed quickly, just given some of the risks associated with this. But on the other end, and you pointed out this a number of times within this op-ed, is there, there is a, a strong reason to proceed very cautiously on this. Yeah, so I think you're just regulating outcomes. Is a medical device safe or unsafe? Is a car safe or unsafe? Is something compliant with the SEC rules on trading? And that's not, and you apply that the same whether it's AI or not AI. So you're regulating basically based on outcomes, based on accepted concepts of safety, rather than treating this in some new and different and scary way. All right, Jason, we got to leave it there. Always appreciate you joining us here on Yahoo Finance. Thank you so much. That was Jason Furman. He is a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, previously serving as chairman for the Council of Economic Advisors.